This is an interesting puzzle. We have an Amazon plug-in thermostat with external probe. We have an extension lead and we have a hole burnt through the extension lead. There's a cover note with this. Hello, my name is Reese. I send you an email explaining my bad experience with a cheap thermostat I purchased from Amazon. It was getting chilly one night, so I plugged this thermostat into an outlet, at which point the temperature probe wire shorted with a nearby extension lead. I froze, staring at the ball of plasma, which would be, you know, when that happens, it is quite scary. Even my friend on the phone, Ben, heard the ordeal. Anyhow, I figured this would be right up your alley to tear down and diagnose the issue with this device, assuming there is one. Preliminary investigations suggest that there's not actually an issue with the thermostat, but there's definitely an issue with the cable, and I think it's just sheer chance that the thermostat probe cable was lying in the vicinity of it, although I don't actually feel... Feeling along it, uh, he did mark, Reese did mark the uh, cable, put a bit of tape around it in the uh, place that had arced, but I don't feel that, having removed that, I don't see any damage to this. So let's investigate the cable first and see if we can work out what's happened. When we go in close to this, are you going to be able to see this? Can I zoom in close? Can you see that lovely clear line there? Actually, what am I doing? I've got a picture of it. Hold on. I took a picture. Yeah, that's, that would have been helpful if I'd just uh, cut straight to that. Here is the cable with a bit of a clean slice across it and then the burning. Now, here's what I think has happened because it happens a lot in the entertainment industry when people don't separate cables in the correct way. Quite often in the entertainment industry, you'll find people uh, roll the cables up. I mean, it's a fairly standard practice and put some tape around it, but sometimes they put too much tape around it. And when they do that, let me just zoom out again here. When they put too much around it, instead of just being able to pull the cable apart, you have to actually have to cut it. When that happens, sometimes people cut it a bit too deep. So let me show you what happens here. This is a cross section of the cable. A blade gets run across it and it hits the live and neutral copper. So this is the blade. I'll just show us a stand the knife. I'll show us a stand the knife blade. Does that is it called a stand the knife blade elsewhere in the world? But it cuts through. And if you were to look at that cable afterwards, you'd see that lovely clean white line where it's cut. But you'd also potentially see the exposed brown and blue underneath, or in some instances brown and earth. Uh, and as you parted it further, you'd actually see the bare copper as well. But that doesn't mean that it's instantly going to arc across here. However, as in the entertainment industry, what happens is that uh, when it gets wet, say for instance the cable gets used outdoors, or a drink gets spilt, or you're spraying a spray or whatever, and water creeps into that thin slot there, because uh, capillary action will always sort of drag it in. Now you've got a conductive film in here between these, and what happens is a little bit of current starts flowing, and it's not really perceivable, it's invisible, but there's a tiny little crackling line there, and it builds... Progressively, it builds a little sooty uh, bridge. It's called tracking because it's creating a carbon track. Once the carbon track is enough, it suddenly becomes self-sustaining. It will start flaring out the side of the cable and burning, and it coats that in the carbon. Sometimes it will blow itself clear, loud pop, and sometimes tripping the breaker in the process. Or it will just burn and fart. Or uh, in some instances, it will... It will uh, just repeatedly do it every so often you'll get a pop and you won't if the cable's hidden from view particularly if it's an area that someday gets damp sometimes is dry you'll get an intermittent fault that it just occasionally just the breaker trips and you reset the breaker and it just lasts for ages and then it doesn't uh, later on it'll trip again the same happens inside connectors i reckon that's what's happened here so tell you what let's get a sharp knife and bear this back and take a look at the inside of this cable. So I'm going to cut the cable completely. The answer here, if the cable isn't actually physically faulty, the answer here is just to uh, cut the cable and re-terminate it into that, but also check the cable along its length for any sign of that. In the entertainment industry, we pull the cable through our hand, not while it's live, and you can feel either bits of tape that we left on it, or you can feel a, a nick in the cable, a little notch. So let me ring this round. I'm not going to be too careful here because I don't really care if I cut into the cores because it's wrecked anyway. So if anything, I'll just be super reckless because I want to cut right in and bear it back like that. And I'll cut this back here 
I should zoom down for this, shouldn't I? That would be better, because then you can marvel as it all gets exposed. So I'm just going to ring this cable around here, and then I shall slit it long ways from the other side. So I've ringed it, I'm going to snap the insulation. And then I'm going to try and slit it from the other side. Notably, the earth wire is on the bottom here, as kind of predicted. If the earth wire had got involved, uh, it would hopefully have tripped the RCD if there was one. If there wasn't an RCD, it wouldn't have tripped it. Owing to the fact there's no RCD. So now I've slotted that. Can I peel this off? Where's my side cutters? I've put in such a thin slot here that I can't even see it. There it is. Let's peel this and expose the carnage inside. Carefully peering that back. Oh, the, actually, the live wire has broken. And it has, it has actually punctured through to the neutral. I think this is a faulty cable. Either it's been stretched or it's been damaged in some way that it's actually... So what I just said there about the nicking between the live and neutral, I mean, it might be damaged. I'll have to examine this more closely. But in this instance, it looks as though uh, I don't see damage, significant damage other than surface insulation damage. It looks as though the actual live wire has broken, suggesting maybe this cable has been stretched at some point. Someone's actually uh, pulled it too hard and that's resulted in the wire breaking, but it's possibly been hanging on by a whisker and just the disturbance of this being plugged in. Oh, of course, it's close to the end, of the, especially if it's plugged into this. Uh, just pulled that apart and then it started drawing an arc and when it drew apart that's when it has actually started pulling because it's got a load it started pulling an arc i wonder what was plugged into that possibly a heater or a uh, other high load device and that's just finished this off right here now we've seen that uh, which is kind of unexciting i could take a picture but it's really just the brown wire has two broken ends Again, a common problem in the entertainment industry, you'll get a bad cable and uh, when you go up to the plug end and you wiggle it like that, or the socket end, you wiggle it like that, you can usually find it, but it usually fails at the point of the anchoring here, the restraint. I tell you what, let's take a look at this now, let's plug it in. I, do th I think this is completely innocent. It doesn't mean it's well isolated, he said, picking up the exposed metal bit. So this thing has a let mode, cycle timer, CD on, CD off, CD off, okay. Start temperature on, start temperature off. Or you can set it to temperatures and you can choose which, you know, I suppose ultimately, uh, that means it can either be cooling or heating. Well, that's quite useful. Um, and how fast does it respond? Pretty fast. Yeah, reasonable reasonable enough. Right, let's open it. Let's get it open and see if it uses a capacitive dropper or if it uses a proper isolated supply because this is low voltage cable. It's not something that should be run at 240 volts. Uh, screwdriver. One. Two screws. Do I have to take this one out, or is that just purely holding this together? Sometimes when you take those out in these assemblies, the whole lot parts. Is it going to part? No, it's not going to part. Is there another screw under here? Will I have to spudge it? Spudge. Oh, oh, here we go. What do we have? We have... A little switchboard power supply. We have the incoming supply. We have a bridge rect for... I'll, I'll take a picture of this and we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. And resume. And it's very modular. Let's just zoom down a little tiny bit. Not too much. 
So what we have on here, we've got the relay, which is actually rated 60 amps at 250 volts. It's not uncommon in stuff like this to find it only rated for 120 volts, but it is rated correctly. It's a 12 volt relay. This looks a bit out of focus because the focus was down onto the circuit board. The chip, well, let's start with the uh, incoming supply. Okay, the incoming supply uh, comes onto these connections. The neutral is just bringing the uh, supply up for the switch mode chip. But the live is being switched, you get two lives, and they come on here, the two lives, and go through the relay with uh, an anti-tracking slot between those connections and the low-voltage side of the relay. So they're sort of making an effort for isolation here, because this is where the transformer is going across from one side to the other. Um, not really much else to say on the back of the circuit board there, but there's lots to say in here. This chip, I'll show you the uh, schematic for it. It is a PN8355 generic switch mode chip, very simple. It's got the bridge rectifier, uh, smoothing capacitor, switches the coil through the transistor in the chip. It's got the snubber network, They just I'll show you that on the thing. It generates its own supply from a little feedback winding, uh, and it has uh, also a tap off that for the feedback resistors and uh, other stuff like that, and the current sense resistor for sensing the current through the windings. The output is just a diode and capacitor. It's just a generic switch mode chip. There's not a lot exciting to them once you really get to know them. So let's take a look at that. There's the current sense chip. You can tell that because it's a very low value. Here's the bootstrap resistor going to the bootstrap capacitor uh, from its own little winding on there. The primary winding has that little, what they call the uh, snubber network is going through this diode. It just clips the spike when the coil turns off, the transistor in this turns off. And it diverts the spike over to here, this capacitor which absorbs uh, that spike, but then there's also a resistor across that that just gradually discharges it. The power in the first place comes from the live. The neutrals come on to one leg of the bridge rectifier. The live comes from the unswitched side through this resistor to the bridge rectifier and then it's got the smoothing capacitor. The output is this diode to this capacitor. Also on this circuit board, the thermistor is connected to the negative with one connection. It's under here. This is a little ribbon cable. There's only four connections. Uh, the four connections are 12 volt up in the two middle pins. The thermistor back, because it references to the zero volt rail, the negative here. And the other one goes through this uh, really high value 10k resistor to a J6 NPN transistor to switch the relay and there's a little SPAC EMF snubber diode there. That's what's on this. Let's take a look what it goes up to. It goes up to the LCD board which has also got the buttons on it. So this is the set of gold pads that go to the zebra strip and also presumably with these round ones it's for the uh, for probing it to test it. It's based on a little SC92FC7351M chip. Let me see if I can just find that. It's, it's all in Chinese, but not to worry. Uh, the main thing is, it's an 8051. That's a really old microprocessor ar architecture. 8051 based chip uh, with 256 bytes RAM, 8 kilobytes flash, 120 bytes, bytes EEPROM, analog to digital converter. That's ideal for the... Uh, for the uh, reading the thermistor and then things like pulse and modulation not needed and the UART, the Universal Synchronous Receiver Transmitter uh, which is a sort of serial driver which is maybe being used I'm not sure what they're using for this because this is the LCD driver that uh, does all the sort of like the scanning of the LCD and the polarity swapping uh, and all, all we've got here are just uh, a few da data lines coming across data and clock probably so here are the four connections that come up here. We've got the 12 volts. Uh, the 12 volts comes up and it's got a decoupling capacitor and then it goes through a 470 ohm resistor to the voltage regulator. The reason it goes through a resistor is just because then the resistor is dissipating some of the power and the voltage regulators are dissipating some of the power. It just shares the load. It means the regulator doesn't get too hot because it is dropping from uh, the... I mean, it's not under a really heavy load anyway, but it is dropped from 12 volts to 5 volts, which means, you know, there's, it's dropping 7 volts across that. So that will just share the load. Loads more decoupling capacitors, one zero ohm link. Uh, and this little bit of circuitry here is a another decoupling capacitor for the uh, thermistor coming back up. And then the resistive divider that goes from the 5 volt rail to the thermistor. Uh, the thermistor goes to zero volt rail and then that way 
this chip can actually measure the temperature from the voltage coming back from that as the resistance of the thermistor goes up and down. What else is there? Uh, the output from this pin goes to the this connection in the ribbon cable and that goes out down to the relays transistor. We've got this 2.2K resistor which goes over to this LED. That is it. The buttons are just straight connected to the uh, microcontroller with internal pull up because that's the common zero volt rail there so when you push the button it will just pull that input down low. That's it. It's a very textbook design. All the secret stuff, all the secret sauces in the chip as it always is. So uh, that is it. The fault was just a cable that may have been stretched at some point when it didn't quite reach as far as it was wanted, or it might have been damaged in, a, in the factory. Who knows? But uh, certainly it had split, and certain, certainly when it, all it took was a bit of disturbance to finish that off, or the switching of a heavy load, maybe. And this is uh, presumably working then, assuming that little ribbon cable has survived me yanking everything out, and presuming the, the zebra strip actually makes connection again. You know what it's like when you work with these things. You take it out and the zebra strip never connects again. But I shall try and put this together and uh, I'll see if it works. Uh, I'll do that right now. One moment, please. Well, it took a couple of goes, but the zebra strip has now made connection. It didn't make connection very well the first time. And the unit uh, seems to be working okay. So, uh, yeah, that's it fixed. And that was a problem. So nothing really sort of significant. It certainly wasn't this unit that caused that. It was just a damaged cable. But quite interesting taking this whole lot to bits anyway and just seeing what makes it tick.